before my uh, introduction of Dr. Butler, uh, we do have one uh, housekeeping kind of uh, notice for you in the audience. We're filming this event today. Uh, this uh, lecture will be eventually available on our Maxwell Institute uh, website and potentially in promotional uh, materials as well. So we wanted to warn you all that that filming is taking place. If you prefer not to be included in an incidental shot or two, we'd invite you to sit toward the back, though we hope that you feel OK about showing up in an incidental shot or two. That being said, you've been <laughs> we want to make sure you are warned that you might show up in the film if you're, if you're toward the front. Uh, thank you all for that. I'd like to spend just a minute or two now to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Anthea Butler is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Africa Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She currently serves as Chair of the Council of Graduate Studies in Religion at Penn. In 2005, she was President for the Society of Pentecostal Studies. She is the author of the University of North Carolina Press volume, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World. Professor Butler's career as a scholar, public intellectual, and professor embraces the academy, the public, and the Christian church in various forms. From starting her public writing as a blogger for Religion Dispatch as the online uh, scholarly uh, journal and news site. She now writes opinion pieces on contemporary politics, religion, and race for The Guardian, The Washington Post, The New York Times. She's also been a media commentator on religion and politics and race for the BBC, MSNBC, CNN, and ABC. She's also served as consultant for the PBS series God in America and for the American Experience feature on the early 20th century Pentecostal leader Amy Semple McPherson. She's a historian of American and African American religion, and her research and writing spans religion and politics, religion and gender, African American religion, sexuality, media, religion, and popular culture. She's currently completing a book on evangelicals, politics, and race, and is starting work on a project on reading race and religion in the 19th century. A couple of more personal notes. Dr. Butler and I met on the set of the Melissa Harris Perry show. <laughs> and I was struck by the fact that I was more nervous than I'd ever been in my life. And it was no thing for Dr. Butler. So she, I looked to her for a model of calm and uh, poise, no pressure. I can see now I'm raising the bar in a way that I didn't mean to. Uh, Dr. Butler has a gift for connecting with multiple audiences, and I've long been um, appreciative of the mix of intellect and uh, accessibility for both her writing and her speaking, the way that she connects with multiple audiences. Uh, in addition, I'll note that we're both members of the LDS Evangelical Dialogue Group. Uh, and in July, with Dr. Butler, we toured Kirtland, a historic Kirtland together. On that uh, trip, she noted that this was not the first, but only the latest in a long line of uh, experiences that I will uh, describe as uh, amounting to an impressive uh, set of examples of LDS street cred. In all, she has sung the Spirit of God in the Kirtland Temple itself. She has taken students to Palmyra and the Hilcomora Pageant. Just yesterday, she, or just this week, she toured Temple Square, the LDS Humanitarian Center, LDS Welfare Square, the LDS Church History Museum, and the LDS Family History Library. After today, she will have spoken at BYU. She reminded me this morning that she only lacks a trip to BYU Hawaii <laughs> from completing the entire LDS experience. So we're working on that. 
Um, so I will, I will welcome her up with a presentation of the, the, uh, the way that we say thank you as best we can at BYU uh, with a box of chocolates. <laughs> and then we'll turn the time to you. Welcome her with me, would you? And Dr. Butler, uh, this presentation of the chocolates will be made by a friend of mine. Yes! <laughs> for having me here at the Maxwell Institute at BYU. Special thanks to my friend Spencer, who indulged my request to make a visit to BYU. And we started talking about this, how many, how many months ago, almost a year ago? And I asked this, I said, do you think I could come and do this thing because I found something? And he said, yes. And so I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to be here with all of you. But before I begin my talk today, I want to set the stage a little differently than I normally would for an academic talk, in part because of the subject matter. This paper and talk came about because of a fluke. I was copying some materials in the American Baptist Historical Society archives a few years ago, and I came across a picture. And it was this picture. And we might want to turn those lights off for a second so we can get this down so you can see it. It is a Mormon family. What in the world is a Mormon family doing in an American Baptist um, historical archive and a historical magazine? Well, the reason why they're there is because there was a Mormon polygamous family. And this is a copy of the Home Mission Echoes, which was published from the 1880s up till about 1910, when the American Baptist Publication Company ceased publishing Home Mission Echoes. And I'll get to a little bit of history about that. What I was originally looking for was something for a project that I was working on in African Americans and Baptist, a magazine called Hope, which was published by the First American Home Baptist missionary, Joanna P. Moore. This was a magazine that was used to teach African Americans uh, who could not read, how to read the Bible, how to teach um, themselves and each other and their families um, Bible verses, basically. And when I found this, I was puzzled because I couldn't figure out why am I looking at a polygamous family? Now this picture, just to give you the provenance of it, originally appeared in Harper Magazine in the 1880s, and it shows up in a lot of different missions publications. And um, this goes alongside some of the other work that the American Baptist Home Missionaries were doing with Native Americans, Chinese, immigrants from Europe, and the Mormons. I didn't know what to do about this, and they were calling Mormons heathens, and I thought, well, okay, there's a story here, and I need to figure out what this story was. That story was a history that I did not know about the American Baptists. If you don't know anything about the American Baptists, they originated out of a split between Baptists, the Southern Baptists are the ones who wanted slavery, the American Baptists were more from Northern Baptists, and they were, um, they were uh, abolitionists for the most part. Okay, so that's one way to sort of see them. But they were very big on missions, and one of the first missions that they did in America was a home mission that they sent out this woman that I was trying to research, Joanna P. Moore. Let me tell you about what first their belief about home missions was, and I'm going to quote from them, Home Missions Echo Magazine of 1892. Home missions present a patriotic and home defense work, as well as Christian work. They appeal to the instinct of self-preservation, as well to the love of fellow man, to patriotism, as well as Christian zeal. 
While the American Baptists would go on to do missions here and around the world, one of their biggest failures was the mission here in Utah to Mormons. And I bet you don't understand why, but I know you know. Okay? <laughs> you all held the ground pretty hard on them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So this talk is about failure, actually. Failure and what happens when you fail, and how you deal with failure. And in the case of the failure of the American Baptist Home Missionary Society, they dealt with, favor, uh, with failure by using polemical um, literature. And we'll get to that sort of at the end. So that is sort of a, as we say in the um, more liberal circles, we say that, oh, this is going to be a trigger warning about the kinds of things that you're going to see. But I know if you're here, you already know what that's like if you know any history about your church and you do. Okay? So let me introduce you to the title of this whole thing about what we're looking at and why we're looking at an octopus. Okay? <laughs> This is the Mormon octopus. I bet you didn't know there was a Mormon octopus, right? <laughs> now you do. Um, what you know about this Mormon octopus is that this particular one on to where I'm pointing, which is probably to your right, is a track that actually exists at Westminster College here in um, Salt Lake City. It was a track that was published by the American Baptist Home Missionary Society, which sold for about you know, half a cent a cent, basically. You could buy a whole pack of those and pass them around, just like you, people pass out tracks now, chick tracks and things like that. But in the November 1898 issue of Home Mission Echoes, which you see over here to my left, where I'm pointing, this is where that picture originally appeared. The track doesn't come out till 1899, actually. So this is actually first appears in 1898. They were frustrated, and the reason why this happened was because they were over the fact that missionaries that had been dispatched to the darkness of Utah had not the results they hoped for with their mission plants in Provo, Ogden, and Salt Lake City. With Utah becoming a state on January 4th, 1896, the Mormon hierarchy to them had only grown stronger. With that in mind, the front piece topic of the month was a map of the United States with a big octopus covering the states of Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Idaho, and Wyoming all according to the American Baptist, growing strongholds for Mormonism. At the top of the map, you can read the following, and I'll read this out for you. Mormonism is an ecclesiastical and political despotism. Like a huge octopus, the Mormon hierarchy is fastening its tentacles throughout the Rocky Mountain states and is sapping the very lifeblood of American freedom. This particular image of the octopus on the map would become a symbol to evangelical and mainline Christians of what they consider to be the insidious nature and spread of Mormonism, not only in the Rocky Mountain states, but throughout America. What I'm interested in, or what I think you will be as well, is how the American Baptist Home Missions moved from a regular home missions endeavor to becoming a source of anti-Mormon literature that would fuel mainline denominations like the Presbyterians, Southern Baptists, and others who considered Mormonism not only a threat to Christianity, but America. And I, I want to stop here because this is sort of out a little bit out of my wheelhouse because I don't normally deal with this. But one of the reasons why I wanted to pick up this project is because I'm really interested in a in concept about how people think about religion and what we call Americanism, this movement that really gets going in the 19th century and goes up to the 20th century. Who's a real American? What can we call a real American? Why do we call other people not real Americans? And how do people promote Americanism? So that was one reason why I wanted to do this project. The second was I was really shocked because normally the American Baptists are really nice people. But this showed something about them that I had not really seen before in their missions literature. You understand if you read 19th century American sort of missions literature, it's always sort of polemical when they're dealing with different people groups. But that is all under the guise of we want to make you Christians and we want to be happy. But the kinds of talk and the kinds of things I saw in the magazine that were addressed at Mormons seem to be have a much harder edge to it. And of course, those of you who do Mormon history understand what that is. But for me, this was something very different because it was almost as if they lumped in Mormons with everybody else who they thought would degenerate. And I just could not understand why. As coming from today, I understand why back then. But coming from today, it was really hard. So there's three things I want to talk about today with you. One is the composition of these missions, how women were at the forefront of this process to convert Mormons. Second, how interest in Mormon religious practices, edicts, and statehood affected the American Baptist Home Mission's interests. Third, how the failure of these three missions in Utah, Provo, Ogden, and Salt Lake cities, coincided with the production of these anti-Mormon materials and channeled the American Baptist anger at not being able to convert Mormons 
to their version of Christianity. So where we want to start off with is talking a little bit about how this all happened. And I have to start off with education because education is a big important piece of all this and how they get started with this. And one of the things that American Baptists do is to go into a place and usually start a school. So the first consideration of the work with American Baptists would start in 1882 with the Reverend Dwight Spencer, who was actually a Baptist minister here in Salt Lake City. He had a small congregation and had traveled back to the north to go to an annual meeting of all missionaries and people who were interested in missions in 1882. When he came to that meeting, part of his speech talked about women's degradation and the misery of living in polygamy and urged the group to send Christian teachers at once to this important mission field. Now, this was 1882. The first missionaries that I could pick up that actually came here were, was in 1888, in August of 1888, exactly. They sent two teachers out. One is in Salt Lake City, a Miss Mary Buckley, and then there's a Miss Julia Hill in Ogden, Utah. Miss Hill writes a letter to the Echo as she comes in two months after she arrives. She says this, I have now been on this field for two months and I find many things discouraging and a few encouraging. I began my day school on the 27th of February with 16 scholars and the number has increased to 32. I have not a single Gentile scholar, that would be somebody like me, all are Mormons or apostate Mormon. The children are very backward in their studies. One girl of 10 did not know her letters and several others were not much better. Not a scholar in the school could tell us why we celebrated on the 4th of July, and some did not know that they lived in Utah. Now, let me stop here and tell you what I think my suspicions are about this whole thing. One is, is that there's a big influx of um, immigrants who were coming in, so obviously, if you've been traveling across the country, you might not think about what the 4th of July is, and nobody really taught you that. Secondarily, it seems pretty clear to me throughout this literature that there's a way of couching Mormons, and that way is to say that they are not intelligent enough, or that the ones who become more intelligent and end up doing things in the school um, are the ones who are more likely to convert. So this is a way to sort of um, already start to kind of push against uh, what people are doing in the school. So what they do is two things. One is they have a regular day school, which is an everyday school that people go to. And the second is a Sunday school for the benefit of the children, both non-Mormon and Mormon alike. So you have both groups as children meeting. And you see a couple of letters. And then in 1891, there's a change in missionaries. And these two missionaries who I'm going to talk about for the most part for the next few minutes are the ones who end up staying the longest. And that's a Miss W.H. Coffin who served at Ogden, and an SB Converse who served right here in Provo. They were the most prolific missionaries that would serve during this time period from 1888 to about 1896, 1897. There's several others, but they don't have as much success as these two, and they're not as consistent in writing letters. So part of these tenors of these letters would report back to tell certain things. One is to tell about what progress in school is, how many numbers of people would come in, and major events in Mormon church life. And this is something really big that I want to talk about in the second piece, because there's a lot of following of everything that's going on with Mormons. And I was really quite amazed to see how many newspaper articles and how many things they put out about the quorum or the president or somebody else when that happens. They print a lot of these things within the home mission echoes. Okay. But the biggest thing that they're up to, and the thing that is most troubling, is about conversion. And they're trying to really convert Mormons. And the way that they want to do this is, if we have a school, which is obvious, we can do this by getting the children first, and then hopefully the children will go home and get um, converted, and they can convert their parents, or something will happen, so all of this will start to move a different way. So let me read a letter here from Provo in May of 1891. Our school numbering 85 pupils was organized in October of 1890. The children and their parents have aided in increasing our number. Many pupils frequently remain at home assisting in household cares, but those in constant attendance have made rapid progress. I am told that in the, never in the past it has been so many strenuous efforts on the part of the bishops to prevent the children of Mormon families from attending our Christian schools. Though the pupils, the homes are through the pupils, the homes are reached and the foundation of the churches is laid. The people are breaking away from their errors and need guidance. So one of the ways in which they try to do this, obviously, is to get children, but you can already tell that there's, there's a problem. 
And the problem is, is that Mormon leadership does not want these kids going to the school. There's always a tension. Now, I can see this tension going through the first 10 years of this mission because part of what happens is, is that there are moments in which there's, um, there's a friendliness towards these schools, and then on the other hand, something usually happens and that friendliness and the kids go away. And that has a flow and ebb due to winter time, um, work schedules, things like that. And so this troubles the missionaries very much. Let me give you another place from Ogden in Utah, February 1892. Our work has prospered during the year. Many of the Mormons, and this is a year later, wish to send children to our mission. As the older pupils leave to work on the farms, others come in to take their places, so the room is kept full. All the new ones are from Mormon families, and one is the adopted daughter, um, daughter of our ward bishop. I'm really trying to figure out who the ward bishop is. You all can help me with that. I believe no one will hesitate to send their children now that the bishop has been so liberal, and this is in this coffin. So obviously, they're trying to get this relationship to happen between you know, the church, um, their school, how they want to do this, but they keep meeting with resistance. Let me give you six months, almost six months later. Provo, August 1892. The people are hard to reach and we feel the lines are drawn more closely against us. Teachers have lately been instructed to watch more closely their charges that they may not come to the Gentile services in school. A father, <coughs> upon being asked to allow his children to come to our school, replied, no, he wouldn't. Then he asked if the Gentiles would be willing to send their children to the, to the Mormon Sunday school and run the risk of being Mormons. He said that he was just as careful his children should be taught in his own faith. And this is from a Miss Bessie Dula. But there was a big problem. This work was very hard for, for these women. And by 1894, some of the original workers had quit in Utah, Dula and Coffin, and they said this, during the past year, our schoolwork in Utah has not brought, been brought before our auxiliaries as we could desire. It was deemed advisable to secure New England teachers for both Provo and Utah. One of the reasons why they wanted to do this and change teachers was because they felt like the New England teachers would be more disciplinary, first of all, and that second, it really would push something different and that perhaps by having people that came from the East Coast, this would really help uh, Mormons to send their children to the schools. Now, on the other hand, what was very big for people, and very big when these happened at the letters and was a fundraising tactic, was to talk about conversions. And let me just take a drink of water and I'll tell you about that in a second. One of the reasons why the American Baptists got so upset with what was happening was that they weren't getting conversions in the level that they liked. They were very upset about this. And so I want to talk about one particular one and talk about the letter that was written uh, by H.W. Coffin in eight, May of 1893. Last winter, I wrote about one young man who converted, converted from Mormonism, who was persecuted almost beyond endurance, and many were interested in him. It was a matter of deep regret that he had gone out from the territory. He had tried to live in peace and help his people all he could, but after enduring all that seemed possible to him, said goodbye to them kindly and went away to work in the mines. She goes on. The work in Utah is a perplexing one, but then it is for the blessed master. There will be two baptisms very soon. One lady comes from, Presbyter from the Presbyterian Church, the other from the Mormon Church. Her folks are all strict Mormons. They have been waiting her husband's consent, and this morning seemed very happy when she told us that he had consented to her baptism. Now, I wonder about this, this narrative in part because I can't imagine that somebody who was already Mormon would consent to their, um, the, their child or their husband, their husband consenting to them being baptized in this Christian church, so I have some questions about that. Sometimes some of these letters can be a little misleading because people will say that they're going to do something and then they don't, but they'll write back and say that they are, in part because they need to keep account. By my estimation, I think that I've only found at least seven narratives of, out of all this time in 10 years that people actually converted. So I think that's a really important piece to kind of think about with this, that they're doing all of this work. But at the same time, they're not getting the same kind of money. So that's one. Um, this also becomes a real big problem for them because once you don't say that things aren't happening very well, you can't fundraise the way that you want. But this magazine served another purpose, and I want to talk about that. And that purpose is to let people know about Mormonism. This is the Home Missions Echo. Uh, this was produced actually in August, May, uh, um, um, Augusta, Maine. This is from June 1891. You probably know what that is, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, they care too. 
Okay, they mm -hmm. care a lot about Temple Square. So this was this was really kind of a surprise. Mormon practices and edicts become a really important piece about what's happening with Mormonism during this time period. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this so that you see you can see what they're saying. We give a representation of the three great ecclesiastical buildings of the Mormon Church from School World and eight, to well, things from other places of April, April 1891. We take the following description and they talk about how this was, you know, Mormon settled in Utah, found in Salt Lake. The most conspicuous buildings are those erected by the Mormons, three of which are shown in the illustration. The Assembly Hall stands on the left, the Tabernacle in the uh, center, and the temple on the right. And it talks a little, gives a whole description about the tabernacle and everything and how it's built and what people do in it, which I'll get to in a minute. There's also a really good picture in another one of the um, echoes of the Eagle Gate, but it just came out a little bit too dark and I couldn't show you, but that's kind of a way to sort of see what they're doing. Now, one of the things that becomes really very interesting to me personally is that there's a lot published about what is going on with Mormonism. As you might guess, a lot of that is about polygamy and what happens with, um, with polygamous families. So there are stories about uh, the three wives and things that sort of appear in the magazines off and on. Some of this is produced by the American Baptist. Some of it is taken from other publications during the time period. But the one that probably surprised me the most was from June 1892. And I know that there's a lot of this that goes around in, in Mormon literature, and Mormon anti-Mormon literature. But there's an actual outline in this edition, and I'm not showing it, I won't talk about it very much, is a, a whole piece about Mormon missionaries and the endowment ceremony. They go through everything, okay? Which was very shocking to me because it was something that, you know, I'm, I know as an outsider that I should not know, first of all. But secondarily, this is not secretive at all. They printed out a whole piece about it and they dedicated this whole June 1892 um, volume to all of that, which I'm not showing here for obvious reasons. But what struck me about this is that there's a way in which they, they want to use these kinds of pictures like Temple Square and the temple and all sorts of different kinds of Mormon monuments. There's also a picture of the Manti Temple in one of these a few months later, that they're using this as a way to start to build a case. And the case is, is that Mormons are trying to take over, they have a different government, they're anti-American, we need to watch out for them. And so part of that also has to do with the fact that when Mormons, when Utah becomes a state, this is a very big thing. And it's actually very frightening for these American Baptist missionaries because of that. So what ends up happening is kind of a conflation. Part of it is that they're upset about um, immigrants coming to America to become Mormons, or they're already Mormons. And this is in addition to a big, giant immigrant population that's coming in. One of the things that they'll say is that we need to figure out a way to get these people to become civilized because we cannot have them here. And the ones that are coming who are already Mormon or that are coming to marry somebody are the worst because we don't know what to do with them. And that becomes a problem, so that's one. Um, the second is that they are very upset about this because this is a time against Freemasonry and all of that. And so if you look in magazines like the Christian Sign Assure from this time period, they're also talking about anti-Mormonism, but they're talking about it in a different way. They're talking about it as being related to lodges because there's, there are ceremonies that people don't understand and they think that these are anti-Christian. And they also feel that oath taking is against the government. So this becomes a way for the American Baptists to say, that they are more American than everybody else. And that's a kind of a big thing. So now what I want to get to is why these um, illustrations appear in the first place. And that's how I'm going to sort of end this. And I want to go back to the octopus, OK? Because we need to understand why the octopus appears. One of the reasons why the octopus appears is that this is the wane of the missions work here in Utah for the American Baptists. They start to have real problems with raising funds. At one time, about 1891, 1892, they are raising up to almost $3,000 a year for missions. That money goes down to less than $1,000 a year. And it makes it very difficult to pay your teachers. It makes it very difficult for people to do things. And money is going to other missions. There's Chinese, there's all these other people. Uh, there's immigrant missions that they're doing in the United States. They feel as though they, can't, they can do better to work with them and that they're having too much trouble in Utah both with fundraising and with keeping people here in Utah. This is from November of 1898, which is sort of the watershed point for when we're going to start to see this anti-Mormon literature appear in the Home Missions Echo. Let me read this quote. 
and this is actually right close to the original octopus that I showed you. Provo. Our school is very small this year. Most of our students have left for more favorable parts of the country. Some families have been obliged to leave as the business is still in the hands of Mormons and they will not help them in any way. It is like in the olden times in Catholic governed countries, only the Mormons have a more politic way of accomplishing the same results. Little children come to the school every day who have been stopped on their way by Mormons who try to dissuade them from coming here. They tell them that the Baptist school is a wicked school and that they will only learn to be bad, etc., and that the Baptists have no God. She goes on. I'm worrying myself of having dirt thrown at my door and of being spoken with reproach. It does seem that though our government was willfully blind to the condition of Utah. We expect that our next senator will be a church man with several wives and several of them with infants, and he does not deny that fact at all, but says he has lived his religion. Now, some of you know that this is going to be the Roberts incident that's coming up, and this is not happening yet, but she's sort of alluding to it there. But this is the first appearance of the octopus, in part because of someone who was working with the American Baptist. And that's J.B. Upham, who's an illustrator who lives in Boston, um, Massachusetts. But he decides that he has been reading up on anti-Mormon literature, and he's an artist, and that he starts to provide these drawings for the Home Mission Echo, which is now called Home Mission Echoes because of some um, moving around and changing people who are doing this. So I want to show you a few of these images and kind of talk about what they were trying to get at. So not only is there an octopus, but there's a tiger. The Mormon tiger keeps his eyes fixed on Congress. The Mormon hierarchy is ready to spend $500,000 rather than have B.H. Roberts expelled from Congress. Why? Because polygamy is still the cornerstone. And so part of this is a real rise because of Roberts, and some of you probably know this already, because of him getting into Congress, they want to push against Mormonism. So this is the next real big phase of an anti-polygamy campaign, even though polygamy has already been said by, um, back by Woodruff that polygamy is not, this is not, you know, this is revelation, you're not supposed to do this anymore, essentially. By the way, that edict by Woodruff appears in the American Baptist Home Mission Echoes. So they pay a lot of attention to what's going on with Mormons and they start to print everything else. But it's not only that. What they also do is they start to vilify the Book of Mormon. And so these are cutouts of about a whole sort of series about how Joseph Smith translates the book. And I wanted to show you two of these to kind of give you an example of what this looked like to someone. This is all Upham's um, illustrations. This starts in 1898 and it goes up to about 1903, 1904. And so while you can think about this as anti-Mormon literature, this is new for the American Baptist. There's nothing else like it that I can even figure out in any of their publications that's even remotely like this. It's the only group that ever do this to. They don't do this to anybody else, they don't call anybody else, he does, they don't do any of this stuff. So this becomes really a sense in which there's something else going on, and I think that something else is about Americanism, which I'll get to in a minute. The other thing that they do with the Book of Mormon is this. Uh, wow, right? I, that was another gasp I had. But this was, I mean, because for me, this is just like, why? Like, but you know, I understand that people get, people are always afraid of things, and so you can start to see this fear that they're having over this. And over the top of the previous one, this is what they said. The American people do not yet realize the perils to our republic through Mormonism. The superficial tourist to Salt Lake City will be shown the interesting sights, will listen to the great organ in the Mormon temple, will be entertained by wily Mormons, and on returning home will declare that Mormonism and polygamy are dying out. The other people that get compared to Mormons a lot are Catholics. So Mormons are usually referred to several times throughout this about 15 year period that I'm looking at as Jesuitical, like they're Jesuits. Like you, you're just as wily, you have the same kind of church hierarchy, you have all these things. But this was really something when I saw this one, because basically this Mormon pill that's sugar-coated, they were saying, this goes down well, but here's how you know Mormon missionaries get you to believe this. You take a pill, it comes inside of you, it's been designed by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and boom, the next thing you know, you're gonna become Mormon. But the other thing about this, and that I can't figure this out in the midst of this, this also appears a few months later, in 1899, is that they're really concerned with leadership. And so you'll see here that I'm not sure where this Johnson's portrait collection comes from, from Salt Lake. I could probably find out the provenance of that. But here's the first five presidents of the church. On this side, here's a picture of Brigham Young and his wives. So there's always a sense in which the, the leadership, the hierarchy is the thing that they believe 
that is taking that is going to do something that they can't really abide by okay and so that you have to always be on watch and this next picture which i'm going to warn you is kind of really shocking is is a big one i want to talk about it in this sense of americanism yeah yeah that's the other one maybe yes <coughs> Mormon isn't the only legal government. Any people attempted to govern themselves, and this is a quote by Apostle Orson Pratt, by the laws of their own making and by officers of their own appointment are in direct rebellion against the kingdom of God. Um, then you see on the side of here, this is their statement, you need a church and state, no room for it in America. Now, here's the problem. What they were all against, and these, these are obviously the first five Mormon presidents, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, William Woodford, and Lorenzo Snow. They are afraid that because a Mormon has been elected to Congress, that this is going to change the fundamental makeup of America and that you cannot possibly have a Mormon to be in office. And so this is the genesis of this particular drawing that you did. You look on the top, it's kind of got like, sort of like the temple, but the church on top of it. And that was their way of saying, this is the marriage of church and state. These, these claws that are coming out look like eagle's claws that are trying to reach out across the country to grab people. And that's, you know, really polemical cartooning, but this cartooning ends up going into other Protestant publications. And so the octopus gets used in talking about when Roberts is elected, there's another picture that I did not show this in, uh, from a great blog, and I couldn't pick it out before I left, is basically with the octopus's, uh, one of the octopus's legs stretching out all the way to Washington, D.C. to grab, to grab and sort of pull, pull back in. So that's the way in which you look at it. The other thing is I'm interested in is how they do this cartography, and this is kind of an interesting thing that some women are doing during this time period, and um, comes out a lot in the whole mission echoes. What this is is like the proposed anti-polygamy constitutional amendment, and of course this comes about because of Roberts, and so they have this proposed amendment. If you don't know, there were over 100,000 signatures that were sent to D.C., and this is how Roberts is you know, uh, not allowed to get into Congress after he's been elected here from Utah. So what they're trying to do is basically take away people's citizenship. If um, they did, what they wanted to do in this amendment was essentially, if you were polygamous, you would lose your voting rights, you would lose your citizenship, you'd lose everything. And so this was another way of them saying, look, there's an octopus's legs on top, but we're going to put this anti-polygamy amendment, and we're going to hope this gets elected, um, gets into um, the uh, Constitution, so that we have a way to make sure that we don't have to deal with Mormons again. But this was also a piece of Americanism. And I use this flag because I want to show you how they do it. They say, nail it to the mask. And this is the constitutional amendment down here at the bottom, what's supposed to happen. And then they talk about the Mormon plot, treasonable authority, the authority of the Mormon church over the state is a fundamental dogma. And then they talk about some of that. They're very interested in how this doesn't seem to work with what they think Americanism should be, OK? This was another one that really shocked me, in part because it goes alongside of the earlier publications that are talking about um, what they think are rituals or what they think is happening in Mormonism. And so this is, of course, about blood atonement. There's a lot of talk also, and I don't have time to go into all this, but if anybody wants to ask me a question, um, some of this is all about the uh, Mountain Meadows Massacre. They talk about this all the time, and I'll just read what's in the circle here for you. It's estimated that no, no less than 600 murders have been committed by Mormons during the occupancy of the territory in nearly every case of the instigation of their priestly rulers. This is from the Salt Lake Tribune that they pulled this out. I think the date on that was like 1876. So they're using even older things to do this. But again, this is part and parcel of um, our illustrator, J.B. Upham, who was designing all of this. And then the print goes underneath, and this is all basically anti-Mormon stuff. And they'll just go through what, what they think blood atonement means and all of that. And so let me close with this last, last piece, and I want to read something that is on top of this particular map. And this is called The Peril to Our Republic. It says, men and women, and this is from another piece, should be on guard in every village of the land, north, south, east, and west. When the missionaries of the Mormon church first make their appearance, let a warning be sounded in every pulpit. Let the women obtain tracts, and I'll talk about that in a minute, which will give a statement of the true belief and practices of Mormons, and let them be circulated in every home which Mormons have been known to enter. If Mormon missionaries were honest enough to tell the real truth about their doctrines and practices, they would not make a single convert among decent, intelligent people. The Mormons know this and therefore have sugar-coated, back to the sugar-coated pill, 
their articles of faith for the same purpose that doctors sugarcoat bad pills, strip and sugarcoat of deceptive words from these articles of faith, and the hideous personality of the Prince of Darkness is revealed. That refers to that other picture. Now let me just talk about this in closing because I don't want you to think I came here to show you and shock you about any Mormon literature. This is more about what has happened to the American Baptists during this time period because that's actually the key. While they are trying to show Mormonism as the octopus, they are caught up in the tentacles of the octopus. And the reason why they get caught up in the tentacles of the octopus is because they spend a lot of time promoting and producing this literature. One of the things that happens with all of this is that um, every there's a month out of every year that they spend on Mormonism, and whatever they write about Mormonism from 1898 forward becomes a tract. This is how the octopus becomes a tract. These tracts are sold in packs of 500, they are asked to be passed out everywhere, and this is what they call their defense. This begins to be passed back and forth between Presbyterians and others, and you see these things coming back and forth. So you can begin to see in the early 1900s, there are preachers who are doing um, anti-Mormon um, talks and, and um, sermons, and they use the image of the octopus as a way to get people to start thinking about Mormonism and all that. Secondarily, this way in which they call Mormon monarchy about statehood and all of this that they've got to push over here. And notice that this stretches down into Mexico because they're very obsessed with people going down to Mexico to sort of move away. Um, this becomes a place in which, it, where you have had these problems, where, where Mormon historians have written about this, an, this way in which people think about Mormons as anti Americanists. This begins during this time period. Part of it is about you know, this proposed amendment against polygamy. Part of it is about the uh, election you know, where Roberts couldn't get put into Congress. Uh, Smoot gets put into the Senate when he's elected, and that creates a whole nother thing. And so for this time period, between about 1898 when we first see this and about 1906, this is a very big push for the American Baptists and they're sharing this material and promoting tracts and other things with others. But the reason why it dies out is two things. One is they can't raise any more money, so they start to put out the tracks. And the second is that J.B. Upton dies right at the end of 1905. And so with his death ends all of this sort of kind of illustrations and literature, and they don't have anybody else to draw this. And so what they actually do move to is a way in which they sort of actually just push back and forget about Mormons. You see that appear between the home mission echoes between 1905 and 1910, I only found four articles from this huge uptick. And I think part of that is because Presbyterians and others pick up the slack for that. But what does this all say about the American Baptists? And I wanna kinda of close with that. One thing I think it says about the American Baptists is that they were very thin-skinned about their missions. They had had a way of thinking about being successful at being mission, missionaries. They didn't know how to figure out what to do here in Utah. They had women who uh, went through tremendous amounts of hardship, even though they were able to plant a couple of churches here in Salt Lake and Ogden, they did not have the kind of success they wanted because in fact the schools didn't do exactly what they thought they were gonna do, which is to bring converts in. And it was a normal way that they did this with African Americans and Chinese and others. It did not work here in Utah. And I need to do some more research about that. The second thing I think that happened with them is that by moving from this um, missions-based model of having schools and Sunday schools, this was a way to this kind of polemical literature that really closed the door, any kind of door they would have had with LDS during this time period. And that made this much more of an antagonistic relationship. The third thing I think, which is probably more, more probable in a lot of different ways, is that because they didn't get the money that they needed, they needed a way to sort of shift focus and not say that their missionaries were taking, in a sense. And so by doing the polemical literature, by selling tracts and not making the same kind of money, but to have, the, have them promote their work in another kind of way, that put them in the case of being more polemical than not, less missions oriented, and more oriented towards trying to influence not only um, people, but the government. And this was their way of thinking about how could they influence leaders to be against Mormons, be get against Mormons in the Congress and the Senate, and to not have them have any place in American life. So I think what this little piece does, and I hope that um, you find this interesting, and I would really love to entertain questions, is to think about the ways in which there's an early set of anti-Mormon literature like Spencer and others have written about. Um, but we don't have anything about this time period, and this is actually a very crucial time period 
in terms of how people are thinking about immigration, they're thinking about what America is, the ways in which this sort of sets up the stage for things that begin to happen in the 1940s and the 1950s. And also, just I would like to know, and I don't have time to really do this, and I just started doing this word search, to find out what LDS people are thinking about this literature during this time period, and how that shapes the ways in which they engage with being American and being Mormon at the same time. Thank you. questions, and if I can't answer something, I'll tell you I'll get back to you. How about that? <laughs> but I hope somebody can tell me something, too. Yes? So it seems to me that with anti-Mormonism and anti-Catholicism at the same time, uh -huh. all the focusing on Mormon temples, Mormon sacred space, Mormon Catholic sacred space mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah. there seems to be uh, a way of defining Christianity as white and Protestant. Oh, yeah. Time, oh, yeah. And that's anti-ritual and anti-material. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it really is, and it, it's really shocking me how much, the, I, I think probably that's why I'm attracted to become Catholic, but I'm just, you know, it, it seems to me that they're making some big comparisons between the two, and one of the things I noticed was that they said, oh, you know, the Mormons are going down to Mexico, they'll fit in really well with all those Catholics down there, you know, because they thought like, this is this is a thing, you know, they're going to fit very well with these churches that are already, already in space. I think you're right about that. I also think it's about immigration and what I can't, you know, what I would like to know, and I need to do some more research on is how much, you know, people are coming from overseas that have actually converged to Mormonism who are coming through because they're seeing some of this in, in New York and other places and how much that is affecting what they say because they're mad about the immigrants too. They're just like, you know, we gotta get these dirty people together and do some stuff with them because they're horrible. And so the almost, the, the two, the, the most derisive languages I see and this whole mission echoes are usually about Mormons and immigrants writ large. Yeah. Yeah, so along with that, the 1891 separation law is specifically about. Okay, that's why, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, and perhaps you said this at the beginning, but how this up and down recruited, how this, how this, this, were they using him? His wife is, uh, yeah, I should have said that a little bit clearer. His wife is already working with the American Baptist, because they're doing a whole bunch of publications during this time period. Some of this coming out of Boston, because there's a lot of money in Boston, this is like, American Baptists kind of have a stronghold there. So they have, when they have their big uh, yearly missions meeting, their meeting in Boston, she's there, and then he begins, he gets to be interested in all this, because that gives him a couple of missionaries. And then this is the first time that he gives out the, when he does the octopus, that's the thing. And, they, and this is when they start to fail, actually. You can see it like the year before. I just didn't use all the letters. But basically, you can start to see where they're not doing as well as they think they should be doing. And then that octopus appears. All the way back. Were any of the Baptists converted to the Mormon faith? No, not that I can tell. Or not that they're telling. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's always a thing, too, right? People are not going to tell you right. what was really going on. Because if you get somebody who converts, right? Then that's a whole that's a whole other ball game. But you know you have to also understand that you know there's a, there's missionaries and there are a few people in the churches like in Salt Lake and Ogden, but that's kind of it. There's not there's not this was not a Baptist place at all for them. They were mostly you know mostly South, a lot in California and others for the American Baptists. So they just, they just did not break the plane here at all. It was really difficult for them. Other questions? Yeah. Just to, uh, I mean, I think they felt like they, they feel like there's you know Catholic immigrants are just as, just as much of a threat. What is different here is that the hierarchical structure. You know, there's another you know there's kind of a famous cartoon in, in Harper's where they show the um, the miters of the, the bishops and everybody coming on shore like crocodiles to eat everybody. You probably if you had a history class, you've seen this before. And so it's the same thing, right? But I but I see Mormons and Catholics getting this more than anybody else, right? Because if, because if people don't understand a the hierarchical structure, b they think you know your allegiance is not to the president or to the constitution or anything. Your allegiance is to Rome. Your allegiance is to Salt Lake. Your allegiance is to the temples, you know, etc. Right. So they just kind of fold these things together to say we'll just lump them both, 
and they're, they're both like, you know, because they, basically for Catholics, they'll say it's Romanism. But what's interesting is that they put Roman, Romanism up against Mormonism in here all the time. And that starts really happening after 1891. There's a piece where um, when they print out Woodruff's thing for, the, for polygamy, they have like two months later, there's a, um, somebody's having a conversation with a Mormon woman and she says, well, I don't know. Next time it could be a revelation that we can have polygamy again. And so they use this as a way to sort of use it against her to say, see, you can't really trust them because they only did this because they're doing it for, you know, to become a state. And that was part of polygamy. But, you know, had, uh, what's his name, been back around back then, up him have been around back then, he probably would have had a drawing to go along with it. <laughs> you know, but he wasn't involved yet. Yes? Uh, you mentioned, like, interactions with local ward bishops and stuff like that. Were there any indications of them trying to interact with church leadership in Salt Lake? No, although, you know, what was interesting is that there was an interview that was published. I don't think it was from them. Somebody said they interviewed Woodruff, and they put that in the, in the magazine, too. But I don't think it's one of them, but I couldn't tell that. I imagine that there probably is some interaction. One of the things that people fussed about a lot, and I thought was very interesting, was that they felt they, they weren't quite sure. These are also temperance people, too, I should say this. They weren't sure if Mormons were drinking or not. They didn't know that. So they kind of just said, oh, they must be drinking. And the dances drove them crazy. <laughs> dances drove them crazy. They're just like, we don't understand. There's just too much dancing. There's all this other stuff. I just thought, this is so fascinating to me because that's the last thing I thought that they would be upset about. But I imagine there was. A, I just didn't really find that much. What I have to end up doing, actually, is there's a whole other set of letters that I need to look at that come into the main home missions office that might be able to tell me a little bit more about whether they're having those interactions or not. But I decided not to do, I, obviously I already got me way more time than I thought I was gonna do today. But I wanted to make sure that I kind of get that before I put this into a bigger piece. Yes, Just wondering what your broader, um, your, your envisioning in terms of a broader project for this. Yeah, what I, well, um, you know, this was, this was kind of like a thing that I fell into. But, but now I'm really interested in, so what I, it, this actually connects to something that I'm very interested in that I've done a couple of talks about that I need to kind of spin out, and one of it is this whole idea about Americanism in the first place. You know, so I've, I've sort of been thinking about a long-term project about between Americanism, and from, I, I would put it like this to make it shorthand, from Americanism to American exceptionalism to make America great again. Oh, wow. Okay? So that's, that's sort of like something for the long term. The short term for this is that I would like to turn it into a journal piece. But in order to turn this into a journal piece, I need some other pieces. And one of the pieces I need, and this is a work that I'm probably going to have to come back to do here in Salt Lake, is to see what's happening on the other side. And if you, you know, if LDS are writing about the American Baptist missionaries, because right. that's what I want to know. I want to put these two things in conversation with them, and it might be a, a bigger kind of project than I think it might be. But I'm willing to work on that because I, I don't like having something that's very one-sided and I'm doing something very one-sided for you today. And, not, and the reason why I did that is because I just saw these fantastic, you know, sort of you know, really awful images. But it also speaks to a time period that I know that people don't really write about very much. And so I want to do that. I'm really like a late 19th, early 20th century person, so. I, I mean, you know, I kind of have an underlying theory, this will probably scare everybody, but I, I want to see if I can prove this or not. I mean, the ways in which they're classifying Mormons in here, I don't even think they consider Mormons to be white people. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you, you, the heathen, okay? And this is something Catherine Lynn Gum is working on, who's at Stanford. She just started a big project on this. And so I'm, I'm going to actually be talking to her a lot about this because what does it mean when you get slapped with the label heathen? Do you even get to keep your whiteness? My guess is no. Yeah, you, you don't, and and so if you don't get to keep that, what what does that mean in terms of that? And then you know to the converse is is that what does the church have to do to turn that around? You know, and that, there's a lot of stuff that happens to make that happen. That'd be another interesting um, going forward from this time period to see when the um, Mormons began to be more American, mm -hmm. the Americanization, so to speak. Yeah. So it would be interesting. Mm 
Yeah. Well, I think that's, I, I actually think that's part of the project of, of people running for Congress and Senate, right? It's like we need to be involved in this, right? But I think that there are other ways too, and I'm, I'm kind of interested in the sort of lived religion cultural ways in which that happens. Not, not so much from the hierarchy, but I want to know, what are everyday people inculcating that makes this happen? You know, because they make that point and comment about, they don't even know what the 4th of July is. You know, so how do you start to celebrate it? What happens about the 4th of July celebration as a result? How do you, how do you work that out? Back in the back. Uh, I was wondering, with um, polygamy being part of the discussion mm -hmm. in, um, in the Baptist wanting to convert um, some of the Mormons, what, do you have um, any research on what the women's response was to that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of letters. One was from the one woman they talk about is um, there's somebody. It's about 1893. There's a woman who's a second wife, who who, who comes to them when her baby's sick and she doesn't know what to do, and she starts to kind of stick around a little bit, and they're really hopeful she's going to convert, but she doesn't. Okay, so that's one thing. What I really would like to know, and I got I have I have to be honest and get deeper into this because it takes a lot of deeper reading to try to figure out what's happening. I just don't think they're making that much headway. And I think in the beginning they get people interested in the schools because of education, but once everybody figures out what they're up to, then it's like, I'm not sending my kids there anymore. You know, it's, it's like anybody else. You find out the school's bad, you're not sending your kids there anymore. Or you're not teaching something that you don't want your kids to know, you don't, you pull them out. You know, and that's the same thing that's happening here. So they can't, they think that they're providing something because it's free and they're, you know, they're taking care of things, but what they don't understand is that they're undermining the very, the very, you know, issue of family. and that's. That's interesting to me because what I think they don't get is that they see they see Mormons as not understanding family at all. And they keep talking a lot about family, 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 but I'm like, oh no, they understand family. They just understand family very different than you do. And it's not it's not their definition. This is a whole it's a whole theological thing. And I don't you know, even though they say all this stuff about, you know, being married for all time and eternity, they, they talk about all that in there. They still don't really get why people want to hold on to the families the way they do. They don't get it. Mullen here about uh, Mormon responses to other missions. So, like, I don't know her like, the exact statistics at all. Mm -hmm. But, like, the Episcopalian missions were pretty successful and were pretty quite a men. Mm -hmm. And I they were pretty entrenched. And I, I wonder what the differences were if there was something about their approach or the fact that it was women or that they were something about, about being Baptist that was scarier than. Yeah. Or if it was just the time that, that I, yeah. Well, one, that's it's time. Two, it's you know, Baptists tend to be really rabid about who you can save, you know, and so that's a very big you know thing for them. And I think they were a lot more gung. -ho. I would call it gung ho, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a nice way to put it, about their proselytization than they could have been. And so I think that was probably more in its more in your face. But you know the Episcopalians had a, they had more time. They had more time to, to establish themselves. The American Baptists come sort of really late because they're already working with African Americans for like about 20 years by the time they get here. Mm -hmm. So they're you know this to them is something new, and they don't do, they just don't do as well. And then they also go you know they're going into China and other places, you know in Asia during this time period too. And so they're they're spread out everywhere, and so they don't have enough. You know, home missions is like this is this is the line of defense for them, but they just don't think they, they can they don't really do as well as they thought they could have, and I think that's about time, and it's about you know what, I, you know for the women especially you know the part where I said she says she's getting you know dirt thrown at her door and everything, there's little snippets of the way that they're being treated that they don't like either, and so I think they have a hard time keeping missionaries here. You had a question. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. They might throw something at me. But um, you know, it, it's going to be really different with them because it's it it will be I, it will be a shock to them too. I can tell you that much. That's number one. I'd love to do it like someplace like Mercer, where the American Baptist archives are, because the the ar the previous archivist she's retired now. She saw me looking at this and she said, "Oh yeah, there's some stuff in here, but nobody's really worked on it." You know, and they've got I have to say they have fantastic things that. Nobody's really, you know, really scratched the skin up. But Baptists during this time period are going through all kinds of stuff because 
you know, the Black Baptists are going through a whole thing about sanctification and what they're going to do with that. You know, American Baptists are going through this big missionary expansion and what they're going to do and how they're either trying to partner with other churches about that and they're fighting about immigration. There's just a lot of things going on. And they've got a lot of publications that end up stopping, like Home Missions Echoes, because they just don't have enough women to put all that, all that stuff out. They don't have the funds to do it either. They start dropping their money. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all for staying with me.